with me today, I have Seth Shabo. He is a professor of philosophy at the University of Delaware, and his main research is on free will and moral responsibility, which we'll focus on today, but he also does related uh, topics of uh, metaphysics, normative ethics, and moral psychology. So Seth, uh, thanks for joining me. Well, thank you, Jordan. Thank you for having me. So we're going to talk about um, a lot of uh, interrelated topics, I think, but we're going to kind of use uh, another philosopher's work as the focal point of this discussion. And I heard you discuss uh, this view, Mysterianism, uh, put forth um, mainly by Peter Van Inwagen on the Free Will Show. I had uh, Matt Flummer on, on this oh, podcast. Great. from yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So I was curious, um, you know, what, before we kind of get into that view, what, I, I heard you answer this question a bit on that show, but I wanted to ask you again, you know, what kind of drew you to moral responsibility and free will and, and the interconnected topics in the first place? Yeah, so I was always interested in moral responsibility. And I, I started out being very interested in ethics and moral psychology. And then uh, pretty far along the line towards uh, completing my doctoral work, I started teaching a section on free will and moral responsibility, which was probably there as part of our kind of standard course because Van Inwagen had been in the department uh, until shortly before I arrived as, as luck would have it. And um, so teaching that material, especially the Frankfurt cases, got me thinking about that association between moral responsibility and free will. And then from there, um, I was, you know, I, I was sort of doing my own research, not necessarily with a view towards working on that for my dissertation, but as I got you know, farther into the work of, uh, of John Martin Fisher and Peter Van Wagen and a few others, I started to think that this is what I really wanted to, to work on. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's one of those topics that is, it's so interesting, both from a theoretical perspective, but also from a practical application um, perspective. And it's, you know, it's interesting that obviously those parallels are the same with ethics. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, we do face these questions about how to assign blame and, you know, oftentimes in, in complex situations where there are multiple factors. And, and so we do really, you know, confront these questions. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, we confront them in a way that we don't have to confront if there's a platonic form of a table. That's right. <laughs> yes. Yes. So we're going to talk about, like I said, um, a view put forth by Peter Van Inwagen. Now, is he the um, sort of generator of the view or is he a main proponent and it preceded him? Um, I don't think anybody had, to my knowledge, no one had really put this view on the map in this debate, in the contemporary debate before. Is there some historical precedent for it? I can't confidently say no, but but yeah, it was Van Inwagen who... Um, yeah, who put this view on the, the landscape of the contemporary debate. Mm. And that view is Mysterianism. So maybe if you could just kind of from a 30,000 foot view, what, sure. what does Mysterianism say? Okay. So a Mysterian, the, the view now that I'm, I'm going to call it Mysterianism, but, I, but we're going to be clear that it's Van Inwagen's view in particular. Uh, we have free will. Free will is real. Um, we are morally responsible for our actions or mainly for the consequences of our actions. We are to blame for the, the bad ones. We're to blame only if we have free will. Um, yet there are powerful arguments for thinking that free will is incompatible with determinism. And so if we, um, so either compatibilism is true or determinism is false. And compatibilism, isn't true in light of these very powerful arguments. So, so far, if we stop there, we would have a pretty standard libertarian view, but Van Inwagen doesn't stop there. Mm -hmm. um, we, he thinks as well that, we, um, that there are persuasive and as far as he can tell, unanswerable arguments against libertarianism. That is arguments to the effect that a causally undetermined action would be not an exercise of free will, but a mere matter of luck or chance. Uh, you know, so you could you can think of an analogy at least with a coin toss or a random number generator. Um, so when we add these arguments to the mix, uh, something has to give here. These these views can't all be right. And so the Mysterian says, well, my commitment to free will is non-negotiable. That's the one thing that's that I'm most um, 
unshakably convinced of. And the arguments for incompatibilism seem more decisive, at least, than the arguments uh, against libertarianism. And so uh, we end up with the view that free will exists, that it's incompatible with determinism, but nonetheless, given the very powerful arguments against libertarianism, it's a mystery how we could have free will. So free will is a real but mysterious feature of human agency. Mm. And I, I guess in that way, the Mysterian kind of kind of gives a nod to incompatibilist arguments more so than just a standard libertarian would, because they're they're granting the, the pull of those powerful objections. Um, but but just sort of saying, well, there is this I don't want to call it an intuition because that sounds a little bit pejorative, but there's this reality of free will that we can't escape. So even with these powerful kind of hard determinist arguments, um, you know, it, someone like Van Inwagen is going to say, I, I feel the pull of those, but yet I can't escape these other conclusions. Is that right? That, that's, that sounds right to me. Yeah. So there is tremendous pressure that the view faces. The belief in free will faces tremendous pressure, uh, but his commitment to it, he thinks in light of how evidently true it is to him that, uh, that, you know, people are to blame for some of their, some of the things they bring about in the world and the impossibility of that without having that without free will uh, leads him to think that, that he has to sort of buck this pressure mm -hmm. from, from these two different fronts, the arguments against libertarianism and the arguments against compatibilism, which yeah. jointly seem to imply that there is no free will. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, I, this was something that I had emailed you about, but it seems like Van, Inwag Van Inwagen's position really kind of has three separable components that could each come apart. There's the Mysterianism part, there's the incompatibilist part, and then there's the libertarian part. So the libertarian, you know, uh, aspect of it, this, um, well, first I should ask is, is um, when, when he puts forth kind of the the notion of, of libertarian free will that he's defending, does it hinge on the sense of, of could have done otherwise, or is it something else? Uh, that's, that's the right idea. I mean, so Van Inwagen, this, is, this might be sort of an aside, but Van Inwagen accepts Frankfurt's argument that you could be morally responsible for what you do, even if you couldn't have avoided it. But he thinks that there are other um, avoidability conditions, I'll call them, um, for moral responsibility that, um, that are correct. And so you're not morally responsible for a state of affairs unless you could have prevented that state of affairs. And that's enough to give you, uh, to give you an, an argument for incompatibilism. Mm, okay. So the libertarian aspect of, of his view is sort of, I guess it's, it's partially subsequent to the incompatibilist portion of his view, whereas so, you know, incompatibilism is stating that if the thesis of determinism is true, then that is incompatible with free will. And then the libertarian and the hard determinist would sort of split ways that's in, right. yes. in the libertarian saying, well, that's true. That conditional claim is true, but we do have free will or, or we could do otherwise or we could prevent a state of affairs um, from, from kind of orchestrating themselves. And the hard determinist would say, you know, bite the bullet, essentially. No, we don't have any of those powers. Determinism does rule out free will. In That's any right. Sense. It's true. Determinism is true. Or even if it's not, it doesn't really help us. And so, right. And so, so yeah, we don't have free will and or moral responsibility. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And then the, so am I understanding the view correctly that the Mysterianism aspect of it is that sort of the Mysterian aspect of the view is pulled by those sort of incompatible but unshakable commitments really to, to accepting that, oh, wow, you know, the, the hard determinists are, their arguments aren't wrong, but I can't kind of get out of this, this commitment to the reality of free will. Yeah, I think that's right. It's, there are unanswerable objections that compatibilism is false. There are unanswerable objections that libertarianism is false. And so there doesn't seem to be any satisfactory way 
out of the conclusion that we have no free will. But if you ask, what am I most confident of all in? I'm most confident of all that we have free will and my confidence that we have free will or my conviction that we have free will is deeper than my conviction that these other arguments, these counter arguments are sound. And so one of these counter arguments has to be unsound. And of the two, the one against libertarianism seems less compelling to me, compelling though it is, it seems less compelling to me than the, or less decisive or, um, than the argument against compatibilism or mm -hmm. arguments against compatibilism, I should say. Mm -hmm. do, do you know how much, I'm kind of curious, the commitment to the reality of free will, that kind of deepest commitment, how, how much of that is phenomenological for Van Inwagen and how much of it is based on theoretical arguments? Um, I, that's a great question. I'm not entirely sure. I, I tend to see it, and you know, this, this is my interpretation, but I tend to think that Van Inwagen takes uh, moral responsibility or the belief that we're to blame for certain outcomes certain consequences as a kind of moral datum, mm. just a kind of a, a kind of given. Um, and so probably I would expect that there's, I would expect that the phenomenology of deliberation also, uh, you know, is, is another contributing factor. But as I'm inclined to read Van and Wagen, it's that just that conviction that, mm. well, clearly we do act, that's not up for grabs. And so the question is, are we to blame for the bad consequences of our actions, the consequences of actions that we knowingly, uh, that we uh, do that are wrong and that we know to be wrong and so on, mm. are we to blame for those? And I think that's a Venn and Wagon's, that's the guiding or driving force behind Venn and Wagon's view that free will is real. Okay, that's interesting because so, if I'm understanding that correctly, it seems like he is maybe implicitly endorsing this idea that moral responsibility and free will are intertwined in a way that, you know, a semi-compatibilist, I talked with John Martin Fisher about this, um, could see them as, as kind of, you know, separating from each other. Good. Yeah. And, and so Van Inwagen up to a point would go along with the semi-compatibilist view. He would say, yes, for actions, I will agree that you could, um, you could separate uh, moral responsibility from free will in the case of actions, but actions aren't really the the focus as far as Vinny can tell. It's it's primarily consequences of actions. You know, the you know things like um, somebody's having been, I, I suppose. I mean, it, you know, could be something like um, this bad outcome. These people didn't get the aid they should have um, on the island, or um, any number of other consequences. It's the consequences that we're really uh, evaluating agents for bringing about. And so Vinnenwagen thinks that you can't separate consequences from avoidability in the same way that you can, so that you can separate actions from avoidability, uh, responsibility mm -hmm. for actions from okay. avoidability. Okay, that's that's interesting. So it's it's you know kind of the focal point then wouldn't be my. I'm trying to come up with a good example. I mean, it, you know, it wouldn't be the main focus then isn't my decision to get behind the wheel of a car impaired. It's really what results from my decision to get behind the wheel of a car impaired. Yeah, that's an important difference between Vin and Wagon and most libertarians. Most libertarians yeah. want to say that uh, a mental act of choosing, of making up your mind, is the fundamental locus of moral responsibility, that that's where moral responsibility attaches mm -hmm. in the first place, because that's what's most directly up to you, if you like. And then consequences depend on some external factors. So Van Inwagen thinks that what we're primarily interested in are the consequences of our actions for the purposes of just determining who is at fault for them or whether a particular person is at fault for uh, for this state of affairs. Mm. That's, you know, that's interesting because that makes me think of the famous essay by Thomas Nagel, Moral Luck, mm -hmm. where he kind of points out the very issues um, with with looking at the consequences where he points out, I don't think he uses the, the drunk driving example, but he, he, you know, the, he, the essay is rich with examples of where two people, you know, can partake in the same decision, but through 
random luck outside of anything they could plausibly sure. control. There's a massive divide in the consequences uh, mm -hmm. of those of that same action. Right. Yep. You yeah. hold fixed everything about the two people and what they, you know, their mental states and their circumstances, but due to something beyond their control, one of them has a really horrendous outcome and the other doesn't. Maybe the other has a near miss. Uh, it seems like there is a difference in how we appraise these two agents, but that seems paradoxical because the difference doesn't depend on anything. They're not responsible mm -hmm. for the circumstances that uh, brought about that difference. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm not very sympathetic to libertarianism generally, but I guess when you when you juxtapose Van Inwagen with the rest of libertarians, I, I think, you know, I'd have to I have to think more about this. But, you know, because of the power of Nagel's objection, I, I do wonder if actually I might side with at least not their conclusions, but the libertarian importance on the decision or the action itself because of because of all of those issues. I do think it seems to me like that's a more natural place to to sort of locate moral responsibility and to see consequences, responsibility, moral responsibility for consequences as deriving from moral responsibility for the choices that uh, that bring them about. So, so mm -hmm. to that extent, yeah, I'm I'm probably more sympathetic. I mean, not that I'm a libertarian, but but I do find that um, libertarian view. That, that sort of package of views, if you like, seems to make more sense to me. Yeah. And it also sort of is, is more amenable to, I think, what's closer to my inchoate view, which is some sort of character-based compatibilism, where mm -hmm. you, you get to, it does seem like, you know, when you kind of focus on the point of decision or action, that, that does give you a window onto the type of person that that is in a way that focusing on the consequences can be pretty separable from that. Right. And in fairness to Van Wagen, um, I will say we do seem to care a lot about um, assigning blame for consequences. We do ask, OK, look, this is a, you know, if we think this is a really horrendous mm. situation and we want a lot of times we want to know if it looks like somebody was instrumental in bringing about this horrendous state of affairs, whether through negligence or through um, malevolence or mm. or whatever it is, we do want to know whether this um, state of affairs uh, can be attributed to this person for the per for um, the purposes of assigning blame. And, and so um, the question is, should we think of uh, moral responsibility for states of affairs as merely derivative, or should we see that as the thing we mm. primarily care about? So I, I don't know if um, Wagon has fully has given us any kind of fully worked out view for um, for or, or an argument for preferring his way to the traditional way mm -hmm. uh, to the more to more I guess I should say more standard way of, of thinking about this. But mm -hmm. I, but I do see why he might think that what we really care about in in practice um, is you know if we set aside. Um, issues about if we set aside philosophers' concerns and we think about well, how do what do we actually care about in practice? How do we go about assigning blame and investigating situations where blameworthiness is at issue? Uh, we want to know was it somebody's fault that the car crash happened or was it nobody's fault? And so, so um, in terms of from a I guess a sociological standpoint, you might say, oh, there is something to what Vin and Wagon is saying here. Whether that fits well with a libertarian picture. Uh, rest with the libertarian picture, or whether that seems more more at home with a different view of moral responsibility. Well, that's an interesting question, I think. Mm. I was going to talk. I was going to save this point for later, but it's it's kind of congruent with with what we've been talking about. Um, in preparation for this interview, I read your review of Van Inwagen's thinking about free will, mm -hmm. and it's it's similar to what we've been talking about. You know, you you say that there's this interesting distinction that Van Inwagen makes, where he rejects what we've been talking about, this focus on choices or actions or decisions, and instead um, says that what we're morally responsible for is the state of affairs that um, we sort of find ourselves in, for lack of a better term. So, you know, it's um, it's interesting, and I'll just I'll just quote you here because you you lay it out really nicely. So, thus, for example, if a bridge ends up collapsing due to carelessness on the part of its designers, 
what the designers are at fault for is not the collapse of the bridge, an event particular, but rather the bridges having collapsed in a state of affairs that could have obtained in multiple ways. What's interesting about that is I, I find that distinction to be an incredibly important practical one, but I am very skeptical or confused how that is a, a metaphysically interesting distinction there because it, it's not clear to me how allowing a, a situation um, or, or a state of affairs to develop isn't going to consist in just individual actions. Yeah. So, so the question is, it's true that when a bridge, you know, when it's true that a particular bridge has collapsed, mm -hmm. there will be some particular occurrence, the, some particular collapsing, some particular instance of collapsing that, if you like, that makes that, that proposition, that the bridge has collapsed, true. So the question is, um, in our best theoretical understanding of moral responsibility, what should we say is the it is the um, thing for which the person is at fault primarily. Is it for um, the particular collapsing or is it for the fact that this bridge has collapsed? And so so that's, um, you know, I don't know if our ordinary practice indicates that we have a preference for one or the other. I think Finn and Wagon will say that one of them, uh, the, um, the state of affairs rather than the particular event is a, Sort of just coheres better with our overall thinking about uh, about blameworthiness. Mm. Yeah, I I do. It's it's interesting because I find that um, the way that Van Inwagen lays that out is psychologically very true. You know, I, I do kind of, and it's actually interesting because, you know, I, I think about this in terms of you know myself a lot, like self self blame or self mm -hmm. praise. Um, you know. I, I'm not, I feel more responsible for allowing myself to be kind of put in certain situations than okay. I do for how I, how I respond in those certain situations. And this is kind of like, you know, like, you know, this is like William James talks a lot about habit and that's almost kind of what I'm getting at where if I, I if I, uh, go out to eat, um, it's almost like I'm sort of forecasting determinism into the future there. Like, I know if I go out to eat at a really good restaurant, I'm just going to eat poorly, you know, mm -hmm. I'm going to get dessert mm -hmm. and I'm going to get extra drinks or whatever. Yeah, right. And, and I feel as though, you know, if I'm blaming myself the next morning or whatever, uh, I, I feel responsible for sort of allowing that orchestration of events to occur, not what I do within that state of affairs. Right. So the question then is, yeah. So is there something that you're blameworthy for as a result of maybe not a particular isolated decision, but uh, something like a series of decisions and ways of paying attention to things and um, you know, yeah, habits of attention, um, various responses to small circumstantial changes and so on. Does your sort of path, if you like, through that series of events that culminates in this bad state of affairs, maybe you broke a promise to um, eat responsibly or something like that. Uh, and, you know, you made this promise and there you are, you ended up breaking it. There wasn't some particular moment when you decided you were going to break it. There wasn't a, a clearly identifiable choice, uh, but instead through a kind of pattern of behavior and pattern of attention and, um, you know, habitual ways of responding to environmental prompts, uh, you both caused and allowed in some measure this state of affairs to uh, to eventuate. And so uh, it's now true that you broke your promise, let's say. Um, and um, and so that's the thing for which you're at fault, mm -hmm. something like that. And even though we can't um, say that there was some specific decision from which your responsibility derives, maybe it was an omission or series of omissions, you know, a failures to um, to focus your mind properly on the reasons for keeping the promise or how it is in this particular restaurant with its very enticing set of menu entries. Uh, you know, you could be lured in. Maybe you should have actually prepped yourself before going in and said, you know, what if they have, you know, this on the menu? You know, what am I going to do then? 
um, you know, have some kind of routine to, to mm. sort of navigate the dangers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it's, it's interesting because I, I find that totally psychologically powerful, but I, it, it does seem like uh, from the hard determinist, that's not going to move their intuitions at all, where, where they're just going to respond. Well, you know, sure that that's totally a, a psychologically useful way to think about it. But of course, any one of those, each step to the state of affairs that you think you're responsible for is itself just reducible to an individual choice, decision, et cetera, that is all going to be determined by factors outside your control. Yeah, so that's right. So, so a hard incompatibilist will say whatever they think, wherever they think moral responsibility should be located primarily, they're going to think there are powerful reasons uh, to the effect that you're, I mean, whether you're not the ultimate source of the course of action you take, or the course of action you take was unavoidable, or the states of affairs were unavoidable. You think, okay, if determinism is true, they're unavoidable for one reason. And even if determinism is false, you don't have the, I mean, the, the shorthand version of, of this is to say you don't have whatever kind of control is needed for moral responsibility, control over which of the uh, possible court paths into the future you end up taking. So even if there is more than one path into the future, even if there are several points at which you have multiple choices, um, multiple pathways into the future, is it really up to you which of these possible futures you actualize? Or, um, or do you have, uh, or do you sort of lack a certain kind of crucial control? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think John Martin Fisher put that in terms of he, he related it to the Borges story, the Garden of yes. Forking uh -huh. Paths. Yeah, yeah. We, we That's right. Yeah. We imagine our lives as, you know, these kind of branches of possibilities and we take one path, obviously, because we only have one reality. Um, right. So, it, okay. Oh, no, go ahead. Oh, just, yeah. So, so you might think uh, according to uh, many incompatibilists, you need to have those forking paths where the having a genuinely open path requires that the entire history of the world up until that moment and the laws underdetermine which of these two possible futures will become the actual future. But even if you meet that necessary condition, there may still be another necessary condition that you don't meet. It has to be up to you in some important way. Mm -hmm. That is, we have to be able to say that which of these two possible futures actually ensues has to be attributable to you in the right way mm. for moral responsibility. And it's a hard question exactly what that way is and what grounds we could have for thinking that we, uh, that we meet the condition for it's being up to us in that way or attributable to us in that way. Yeah. And that's something that was relevant in, I also read your, um, your 2020 paper, the two-stage luck objection. And, and that's that problem right there is really, I mean, that, that really does kind of come down to, to the core of the problems, at least I find compelling with libertarianism, is it's inscrutable really how, you know, even if it's not determined. So as you said, each path is genuinely open to you. It's not clear to me how it, any, uh, the reason why you go down one path or another is if it's not determined, how is that not going to be like the analogy you use in the paper, just a random luck generator or a random number generator almost? You know, you're, you're responsible for pressing the button to generate a number, but you're not responsible for which number gets generated. That's that is the worry that I have for libertarianism. For libertarians, um, there are different responses. I mean, one response to say, look, there really isn't anything more to being responsible for the outcome or for the outcomes being up to you than that it's caused in an appropriate way, that the, the resulting choice is caused in an appropriate way by your mental states. If we think there's a problem, it's because we've inflated free will maybe into something bigger than it really is. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you are a normatively competent agent and um, as long as your mental states, your, your choice is based on your mental states in such a way that you can be said to um, choose and act for your reasons. That's all libertarians really want. And if it seems like a coin toss, 
that's okay. I mean, free will is nothing more than the equivalent of a coin toss where it's your actively formed intentions that are the outcomes of the coin toss. What more a libertarian might say do you really want? Mm -hmm. To which other libertarians have an answer. They're going to say, well, look, you have to be the cause in a distinctive way as a as an agent or substance where your causal contribution is something over and above the contributions of all your various mental states. Mm -hmm. And I think there's still something that libertarians are leaving out that liber that Van Inwagen was at least roughly on target about with his promising argument. And so the mm -hmm. promising argument is in, in outline goes like this, you know, if you um, believe that you'll soon be making it, you'll soon face a choice and it will be an exercise of free will, whether you say keep a secret or, um, or conceal the secret, whether you tell all or, uh, or, or keep mum, right? And so if you believe that it's going to be an exercise of free will when the time comes, then it, so that you're able to take the one course and able to take the other instead, then you should see yourself now in advance as being in a position to promise, for example, to, to keep quiet when the time comes. Mm. But if you also learn from God, say, that the chances of your uh, of your telling all when the time comes are say 0.47 out of mm -hmm. one, you're really not in a position to promise that at all. And so uh, assuming that that's what, um, what causally undetermined actions are like, that they involve these probability distributions, we must not really believe we have free will when we perform these actions. And so there are various responses to Vin and Wagon's at least a, a, there are a few main ones. Um, there's Van Inwagen points out that, that the um, formalization of his argument goes wrong. There are technical problems with the argument, not least that um, the act of promising could change the dynamic, if you like, in such a way, the causal antecedents in such a way that it was mm -hmm. no longer um, a matter, there was no longer this probability distribution. So, so what I've suggested is that there's a way to retool Van and Wagen's argument so that you avoid um, objections like that. And the thing to focus on is not what a person could promise ahead of time to do. I think that's a good heuristic. But to get us to the, the, the core issue, I think we can ask, what can reasonably be expected of the person at the time of action? Is there a basis for saying that the person should choose to do what they believe is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Can we reasonably expect the person to make that choice given, um, given the probability distribution at that time and everything that accounts for that distribution, all of their prior mental states? And if the answer is yes, and I don't think it is yes, but if the answer is yes, the libertarian should be able to point to something about the agent situation that makes that expectation reasonable. And I just don't see what they could point to because anything they could point to, I, I want to say, will already have been factored into the probability distribution. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, you, you point out in the paper, I, I think if I was reading it correctly, where, yeah, like you, you just said, it's going to either be up to the probability distribution, in which case we need not point to anything else, right? If you ask, why did three come up when I rolled a dice? It's just because there's a one in six chance. You know, there's, right. not, there's not going to be anything else to say, really. Um, but if you can control that the three comes up, then, you know, I, then it sort of starts to beg the question of, well, what, you know, was a four really an option? And if it was, then, then it's almost, you know, if, if, if you really could have made the four come up and you really could have made the three come up and which number does come up isn't determined by anything else. Um, it, it seems to me like for, from the libertarian perspective, I don't know how that wouldn't subjectively feel like, I don't know what came over me or almost an involuntary action. I mean, it couldn't be determined by, by anything else. And in that way, I, I don't even know how that's, you know, to use Dennis term, a freedom worth wanting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I, you know, I, I share that that um, intuition. What I will say on behalf of a libertarian here is that um, 
many libertarians are going to say, well, there is a crucial difference between the kind of outcome you've described, which is not an action at all. It's just a happening uh, versus a choice, which is a mental action, maybe an actively formed intention. And so you will feel rightly that you have, if you like, that you've done something, that you've actively made up your mind one way or the other. So that meets one, if you like, that at least does meet one condition for the outcome of the choice. You're choosing this. So call it choice A. Suppose in the end that you, you're choosing between A and B, course of action A and course of action B. You end up choosing course A. Your choosing course A will be attributable to you uh, in a way that the um, outcome of the die, say you rolled an odd number on the die, isn't. And that will be at least part of the basis for making it attributable to you in a moral responsibility preserving way. But mm -hmm. the question is, will it be enough? And I think, you know, that that's a step in the right direction, the fact that it's your action, that you actively form it. But still, we have this question, are you morally responsible for how the question, which choice did you make, A or B, came to be answered? And I don't think libertarians can say, can, can, can plausibly say yes to that, because um, I don't think they can say that, because I think they can say, look, um, you're morally responsible for how that question comes to be answered only if you can reasonably be expected to bring it about that it's answered one way and you can't reasonably be expected to bring that about given that everything that we might ground the reasonableness of that expectation in has already been factored into the probability distribution. Mm. Yeah, from from what you said here and from reading the, the 2020 paper, I, I am kind of beginning to think that any event causal libertarian explanation of this, of this type is, I think, as you say, in, in the episode of the free will show, it's going to look so, sort of deflationary. And I think it, I think in the end, it, it is going to start to be indistinguishable from a type of compatibilism, in a way. And I, and I wonder if when you resist that, as the agent cause a libertarian does then then you really are kind of you're, you're you're forcing yourself into an inflated position of not being able to make heads or tails of how we could possibly have that sort of ability right you are signing on for a, a i think a really <laughs> big commitment and um you know i, I think um well, and so you're doing that and some hardened compatibilists like paraboom think that okay that really is a you know, a big, that's a lot to take on. But if we came to believe that we agent cause some of our actions, then um, we do at least have a solution. It's just that it's very, very implausible to think that we, that agent causation exists alongside event causation in the world. It's, it's coherent probably, but is it actual? Probably not. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so that's one way you could go. Then there's Van Inwagen who thinks, and I'm, I'm closer to Van Inwagen here, that even if we let the libertarian help themselves to agent causation, it doesn't really help. We still have a question. So to put it in, in my terms, um, is it reasonable to expect the agent to agent cause the one choice or the other? And if so, in virtue of what? And mm -hmm. so I think you could extend my argument. I didn't do it in that, in that paper, but I think you could um, build the argument out to to extend it to agent causation. And so I'm very sympathetic to Vin and Wagon's view that um, agent causation, even if we grant it, wouldn't really get the libertarian very far, mm -hmm. quite aside from questions about whether it's coherent and whether setting aside its coherence, there's evidence that, that we might have such a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, I, I take it that the kind of flip side of, of Van Inwagen there would be someone like Galen Strassen, where he's sort of a deep skeptic in the sense that it doesn't matter for him if we do have even agent causal libertarianism. He's just going to say that basic dessert makes no sense in that scenario either. Right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether determinism is true or not. There's a mm -hmm. kind of origination condition that we simply don't meet, mm -hmm. that we couldn't meet. You know, I, I wanted to kind of ask you about that, because one thing that I've really changed my mind about over, you know, reading a lot of these papers and, and speaking with people like yourself is I kind of at the beginning of my investigation into this, I would have said that I'm an incompatibilist in the most classic sense of the term, right, where, you know, uh, 
determinism's truth rules out any sense of, you know, could have done otherwise. And that really vitiates any notion of moral responsibility or desert. But in, in reading some, some papers, you know, uh, Susan Wolf's asymmetrical freedom kind of pointed mm-hmm. me in this direction, Galen Strassen and your 2020 paper hits on this too. Um, it, it seems to me as though, yeah, that agent, that agent causal libertarian freedom, if we did have it, that wouldn't really be grounds for basic desert or moral responsibility either, because it would just, it would be the sense of, you would have to act without respect to everything that was determined in the past, you know, who, who you are, you know, I think Wolf lays this out in her paper really nicely, where you'd, it would kind of collapse into being like a wanton or, or having no character coherence, you know, she has some quote, like you could, you could both desire to respect your partner by not cheating on them and also have the desire to disrespect them and cheat on them. And which one you chose would be up to you, but in a way that wasn't determined by your, your past and your character, it, it just seems to kind of fall apart conceptually. Um, that, that seems like, yeah, a version of, um, that sounds like a version of the, the luck objection. Yeah. And it would apply, it would arise arguably for event causal libertarians and also for agent causal libertarians. I mean, agent mm-hmm. causation might seem to give you a way to sort of stop the buck to say, look, fundamentally, it was you yourself that, you know, faced with these possibilities, it was you yourself that um, that made this choice. That choice really was your doing and not simply the doing of your beliefs and desires. So of course it makes sense to blame you or to think that the buck stops with you in a way that it wouldn't if if you know your states were the only causes. Mm-hmm. But you, we still have to ask, okay, but how does it stop with you that you ended up agent causing this when your agent causing it was um, the, the fact that you agent caused what you did was sort of irrespective of your reasons. I mean, so you will have chosen for reasons. I mean, if if you have a view like Clark's view from 2003, that your um, your mental states are causes, they're probabilistic causes. Um, and because your mental states make this one causal contribution, you can be said to, to act, to choose and act for your reasons. But then you also make this agent causal contribution uh, in which you exercise your free will. Mm-hmm. And so there, there are going to be questions about, um, about whether you, so it isn't really any of your mental states. It isn't anything about you that leads you to make this, um, to, to sort of bring about this choice. It's a, so how can we see it as a reflection on you if we think that um, an action's being a reflection on you has to involve an expression of your um, values. I mean, there's at least, so I'm, I'm not saying that this is a clear objection mm-hmm. by any means, but I do think it's a, it's a, something that's worth, certainly worth thinking about. Mm-hmm. Maybe this is just a semantic question, but if you, if you do kind of hold that view that I was laying out where it, dessert doesn't obtain either way, do, do you think that that would be, I mean, would it be should you call yourself an incompatibilist or should you call yourself sort of a, a, a deep skeptic about responsibility? Right. So if you think, so if by dessert, you mean, yeah, basic dessert. Mm-hmm. Um, and you think, yep, we don't meet the conditions for basic dessert. If determinism is true, we don't meet the conditions for basic dessert. If determinism is false, can we still make sense of our practices of blaming people well there's a consequentialist way of answering yes to that and i think that to me that does seem like a skepticism about moral responsibility but if you think that there's a non-consequentialist justification for blaming um, something broadly deontological um, and it the thought might go like this um, if somebody acts in certain ways they um, they don't have grounds to complain that they've been treated unfairly when somebody else sort of resents them or expresses moral indignation towards them. Um, So in some cases, people really do, can legitimately appeal to considerations of justice and fairness and saying, look, it's not right to blame me for this given that 
there was nothing objectionable on my part. The the mistake was an understandable one given the situation and so on. And other circumstances where if somebody demands exemption, they're sort of compounding or reinforcing the initial presumption that they didn't care enough about the standards of the moral community in the first place, the very standards they're appealing to in demanding that they be exempted. And so I think so I've suggested that in situations like that, the moral community is within its right, so to speak, to reject the demand for exemption and to go ahead and experience the, not just experience, but um, see the reactive attitudes as uh, as applicable or, or um, apt and expressions of them as apt as well, even if there's no basic dessert. And so, so I think the situation in a way is messy because I don't think concerns about basic dessert are misguided or that they can be sort of just made to disappear or sort of um, politely ushered off stage. I think they, they create a kind of residually messy situation for compatibilists. And here I'm sympathetic to some of the things that Paul Russell, um, whose um, who's, uh, interview I, I really enjoyed listening to with you, um, but I, I'm sympathetic to some of the things that Paul Russell says about compatibilism and uh, that we are left with a kind of pessimistic picture. We don't get the kind of clean vindication of our moral responsibility of our moral responsibility practices that we might have hoped for. Um, there is it, it, the, the situation just isn't tidy, but we have to so we have to choose among these different um, considerations, some of which go our way and some don't. And that's that's my way of putting it now. Um, but in the end, we can still, I'm suggesting, we can still um, make sense of our, we can still justify our practices of holding people morally responsible on non-consequentialist grounds. Mm. That's, yeah, that's really interesting. And that's, <clears throat> you know, that area of the debate is where I'm kind of currently focusing on in a lot of ways, trying to understand you know, all of the positions there and what I think about that. And it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because I, I'm pulled in a lot of different ways by those considerations because, you know, on the one hand, you know, basic dessert practices, you know, so, something like retribution, that sort of, um, that, that, you know, almost deontological, maybe deontological, sense of when you know this person deserves above and beyond whatever good or bad consequences it's going to produce to be punished for that yeah i don't i don't see a good grounds for that but there's a there's a an interesting and kind of back, back doorway in which reactive attitudes i think can get off the ground mm -hmm. it's it's you know what you said where i kind of buy strawson and wolf's picture that Reactive attitudes are how we relate to each other and they're sort of how we build and form relationships. And so, you know, there's sort of a broadly consequentialist good in that way, insofar as we assume that having relationships is, is a good as the type of creatures we are. Yeah, yeah there's so a right. There is a, pra a kind of pragmatic argument. There, it's not the consequentialist argument, which, which, um, yeah, which um, P.F. Strassen thought was basically kind of a shallow. He calls it a one-eyed consequentialism. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's instead, it's uh, the the values at issue are the values of, you know, of, of connection with other people and and um, the the possibility of having mature personal relationships. Yeah, mm. yeah. So I'm I'm very sympathetic to the view that um, that are. Uh, that the the core of our moral responsibility practices is uh, is to use Strassen's metaphor, sort of thickly woven into the fabric of of human social relations. Mm. Yeah, and I, I spoke to Susan Wolf about her. Um, there, there was a there's like a famous response to that view by Tamler Summers in 2007, the objective mm -hmm. attitude. Right. Yeah, and, and that and that um, the view that we really could embody. You know, contra Strauss, and we, we we really could embody this suspension of responsibility or reactive attitudes in its totality. Does seem very implausible to me, and and even if it were plausible, not something that we would want. Right, I, and that's um, that is my view as well. Actually, I have a response to the Summers paper, oh, um, nice. where I I argue that um, 
if we think about what it is that we would have to uh, inhibit in order to achieve thoroughgoing objectivity, which is a question that I think Summers was right to say that Wolf doesn't maybe really directly answer. I mean, they, they, there are hints there, but not a full answer. We would have to, I suggest we would have to inhibit our susceptibility to take maltreatment from other people in a personal way to um, and so I suggest that resentment is one manifestation of taking maltreatment personally, mm -hmm. and that taking maltreatment personally is inseparable from this distinctive way of caring about the attitudes of other people that in turn is inseparable from personal relationships. Mm, that's so interesting. That, that's my way of trying to um, develop a thread that I think was sort of there, but, but sli slightly submerged in Strassen's paper. Is that the, the same paper or are they two different ones um, as the one you mentioned before, how uh, when someone asks to be exempted from a moral community, they're reinforcing the very standards that they're asking to be exempted from? But yeah, different. Those are different papers. All okay. I think if I remember right, they're all at the same, all the same year, 2012. 2012. Okay. Okay. Because I'd like to, I'd like to read both of those because the reactive attitudes are kind of, like I said, where I'm, I'm trying to figure out what exactly I think at this point. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So just to, um, cause I know we're coming up on an hour, but, um, to kind of start to, to wrap up, maybe if we could return to Van Inwagen's view, cause, um, mm -hmm. we went down some interesting kind of side roads there, but this is something I wanted to ask you about. Um, in, in response to the problems that we've been talking about, Van Inwagen puts forth this sort of tiered commitment that we've talked about, but I don't know that we've explicitly laid out. So, the deepest commitment, if I understand him correctly, is to the reality of free will mm -hmm. and subsequently, or not subsequently, moral responsibility. They're sort of linked in, in some way. That's right. And above that uh, is the idea that if we have free will, it's sort of entailed that he has to reject the anti-libertarian arguments, which is something we spoke about at the beginning. Then the kind of third tier of the commitment is that, and this is where the mysterianism comes in, I, I think, if, if we were to learn that determinism was true, then Van Inwagen would abandon the second level of incompatibilism and become a compatibilist. So it's a sort of tiered commitment in that way. Am I understanding it correctly? I think that's right. I think, I mean, I think that's, that's the right idea, yeah. Um, so okay. I would just break what you've said into two stages mm -hmm. is how I would do it. So first, there is the mysterianism consists in the view that we have free will, even though um, it appears to be incompatible with determinism, and also they're precluded under, uh, under indeterminism. So, okay. so how can that possibly be right? Um, that how could we have free will when there are unanswerable objections to it? Um, and so then the question arises, well, if you're so sure that we have free will, you're sure that we have free will, and you would continue to believe we have free will, even if you thought determinism was true because your deepest commitment is to free will. So that's the one you're not going to give up. You won't give it up even if you discover determinism is true. Then um, aren't you really a compatibilist? If you say, well, yeah, I would accept compatibilism if I came to accept determinism is true, then Fisher suggests there's a kind of flip-flopping, a kind of objectionable um, you know, willingness to, to switch your view. Um, and, and so so one way to try to sort of reconstruct the exchange between uh, between Vin and Wagon and Fisher, and this might not be exactly what either would say. So we could say that this is an exchange between Fisher Star and Vin and Wagon Star. <laughs> so Fisher Star might open the conversation by saying, "So do you believe our having free will depends on the falsity of determinism?" To which Vin and Wagon Star would say, "Yes," mm -hmm. and then Fisher Star would say, "So if you came to believe that determinism is true." you would reject free will, right? And Van Inwagen Star would say, no, I would reject incompatibilism <laughs> instead. And so Fisher Star would say, oh, wait a minute, on the one hand, you think free will is incompatible with determinism, but on the other hand, uh, coming to accept determinism would lead you to reject incompatibilism rather than free will. So you know, is, is that right? And Van Inwagen Star would say, yes. And Fisher Star says, well, but then you're not really committed to incompatibilism. You're really a kind of covert compatibilist. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, then in Wegman Starve would say, nope, I'm an incompatibilist. I really am an incompatibilist. I believe incompatibilism is true and that there are very compelling reasons for it. So, uh, so there's a question, is Vin and Wagon's um, sort of set of tiered commitments, does it embody, which, which is involved in Mysterianism, is that a philosophically or intellectually respectable view? And why I think it's a great question because I can really see people thinking hard about this and reaching different, different conclusions. And I, in fact, I've seen that with um, you know, professional philosophers and with um, students in a you know, senior seminar where some of them really think, no, you know, you've, you've got to, I mean, to put it colloquially, you've got to put something on the table here. Something's got to be up for grabs, either put your belief in free will on the table or say that, you know, you're open to, to incompatibilism being false. I mean, well, Vinnenwagen says he is open to its being false in a way, just not given his, act, his current beliefs. But if you changed your current beliefs, you would give up you know, incompatibilism. So aren't you a sort of on the way to being a compatibilist <laughs> already? Aren't you? Um, and so I think what Van Inwagen might say in response would go something like this. Um, you know, here I am in my current cognitive situation. In that situation, I find the evidence for incompatibilism to be thoroughly convincing. And so I, I take myself to have decisive reason to count incompatibilism as true. Um, I'm also convinced that I have free will. And so I think determinism must be false. But let's imagine a hypothetical scenario, a hypothetical scenario where I come to accept that determinism is true, right? Very different from my current cognitive situation that would force a reshuffle in my overall belief system. So if I were to take determinism's truth as established in this hypothetical, this counterfactual scenario, I'd have to rethink my belief system and given a choice between preserving my belief in free will and preserving my belief in incompatibilism, I would be forced to revise my belief that incompatibilism is true. I would simply have to change its truth value because um, in light of my still stronger commitment to the reality of free will. Now, in response to Fisher, Fisher says, well, that means you must, you would think in that scenario that there's some reason to accept uh, compatibilism or to reject incompatibilism. And if there's a reason in that hypothetical scenario, then that's a reason that applies in the actual scenario as well. And I think Van Inwagen might say uh, that, look, I, my change in this hypothetical scenario wouldn't be because I've suddenly seen the light or discovered some reason I was missing or found some hidden defect in the arguments for incompatibilism. It, it wouldn't be like this revelation, this, you know, light bulb suddenly went on. Uh, instead, you know, the the arguments for incompatibilism would seem as strong as ever, as compelling as ever, but I would simply be forced to, to, to change my assignment of truth values. I'd have mm. to count it to go from changing it to thinking of it as tr a true thesis to thinking of it as a false thesis for reasons I did not understand. Yes, I would presume that there must be such hidden mysterious reasons, um, but it would be, uh, it would be, reassignment of truth values would come from um, from just a fundamental reshuffling of, of my uh, other views. <laughs> that is a, a, such a good way. I loved that dialogue that you just, you know, you made. But, you know, thinking about this before and, and even now, th there's almost a way in which I almost want to accuse him of being an ultra compatibilist, mm -hmm. where, you know, he's He's saying, okay, you know, free will is going to obtain both in a world in which determinism is true and in which it's false. So he, you know, I take the sort of standard compatibilist to be saying, okay, yeah, you know, we know that determinism is true or likely true, but that's not going to vitiate responsibility in these ways or, or, or a certain freedom in these ways, right? Um, but, but it seems like Van Inwagen is committed to it's like, you know, whatever you want to call it, like an ultra compatibilism where he's like, I just said, in either case, we're going to have free will. And yeah, I'm very, uh, I'm very amenable to Fisher's critique that it's, you're, you're like a, it's either, you know, whatever you want to call it, like an ultra compatibilist or a compatibilist in waiting, you know, you're, you're, you're yeah, about right. to sign up for it, but you just yeah, haven't right. done that yet. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I mean, that's, I like that way of putting it. I think what Vinnenwagen would say there is that 
right now his belief is that in worlds where determinism is true, there is no free will. So that's his belief. Mm -hmm. He thinks there, there are no worlds where determinism is true and we have free will. Um, it's just that if he came to accept that the actual world was in fact one of those worlds, contrary to what he believes, he would change his mind. Mm -hmm. and, and so that seems, um, but as it is, he, he really finds the, um, the grounds for thinking they're mutually exclusive to be, um, to be utterly compelling. I, w I wonder if, you know, Fisher star star could say, mm. well, your current belief that your commitments are, you have these pre-commitments in that way, mm -hmm. th that, I, I, you know, he might be able to say, well, do you really believe then that in a world in which determinism is true, free will is is vitiated or it doesn't obtain because if you're already prepared to disavow that commitment in what sense do you really believe it yeah right i know it's i mean i do feel the i absolutely <laughs> do feel the pull of that thought i just thinking you know if you're if you are prepared to examine your different beliefs in a way i mean you're you're thinking of them as part of a package, but you're also able to zero in and focus on them, assess them one by one. You think, what is the best evidence I have for this proposition? Mm -hmm. Given, in in light of um, you know, in light of the other things I believe, and I I think he could say, look, right now I really do find the arguments for incompatibilism to be genuinely compelling, and I don't see, even if I came to see determinism as true, I would still feel the pull, and I would still think that they were rationally persuasive, I would just then have to say that my rationality itself is somehow misleading me. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's misleading me into thinking that something false just has to be true. And so I will then have to say, okay, I just really am stumped in that case. I just don't get it. But the, the reasons for accepting incompatibilism, I find strong now, and I, they would still seem really powerful to me even then. Yeah, that, that was... And that relates to what I kind of sent you in the email notes for this is uh, that is an it, it's an interesting commitment or, or sort of pre-commitment here that I haven't come across in any other philosophical arguments. And I, yeah, right. And, it, and it's, it seems to, you know, that pre-commitment to compatibilism under the condition that he discovers determinism is true, it, it seems to be excluding, like I said, whatever information would have changed his mind about you know, determinism being true or about the existence of libertarian free will. So it, I'm skeptical that it's reasonable to sort of be committed to the next position before you've understood what's changed your mind about your current one. Interesting. Yeah, that's a great, I, I like that way of putting it. Yeah. Um, so there, there are almost like there are issues uh, in um, almost metaphilosophical <laughs> issues about how you, yeah. what the right procedures are for um, determining your changes of mind in in hypothetical circumstances like these yeah 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 i don't have it you know it's not really kind of a worked out objection but it, it seems there's something very very off for lack of a better word about mm -hmm. about that staged pre-commitment in that way right yeah yeah it seems like it might be you might think instead that it really should be up for grabs at that point or you should treat the uh, the, the different propositions as being different possibilities being up for grabs or not be so firmly wedded to the belief in free will in the first place. Um, and yet at the same time, I can, I can see, I think I can still see Van Inwagen's point, you know, so take it as a datum that people are at fault for certain, I'll say certain things, whatever those mm -hmm. items may be. Uh, we are at fault for the consequences of our, uh, of our actions. And I find these two sets of arguments for incompatibilism and uh, against libertarianism, both to be compelling. I don't see how either could be unsound, but of the two, the one just seems more clearly unanswerable and decisive. And so um, given the fixed, given that I have this fixed point, if push came to shove, it would make sense, even if I don't understand why, even if it re the situation remained as mysterious as before, to give up, to reject the, the argument that I found less um, so, so if I came to accept that determinism is true, um, I would, given that my deepest commitment is to free will, then I would have to really bite the bullet and accept compatibilism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll have to think about that more because um, it's an interesting tiered commitment there.
So yeah, I realize we're, uh, we're running over an hour at this point. So I just want to thank you. Um, this was really a fun episode. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Jordan. It's great. Yeah. If uh, people want to find out more about some of the papers that we've talked about, um, where can they find more about, you know, you and your work? Um, I just recommend the philpeople.org website. Okay, great. Um, stay on the line if you would for a second, but um, thank you again for doing this. Thank you. Okay, well, I want to thank Seth again for uh, for joining me. I really enjoyed our talk and found it very rewarding and interesting. And I highly recommend you read uh, any of the papers of Seth's that I reference or that he uh, references for the first time in the show. So if you want to uh, support this show, you can do so in several ways. Um, you can share it on Twitter or social media. You can rate it on Apple Podcasts. Uh, like this video on YouTube or subscribe on your RSS player or on YouTube and discuss it on your own show and uh, link back to this one. You can also connect me with uh, recommended guests or topics to cover or just get in contact for any reason. Uh, I love receiving you know, feedback from people in any way. You can contact me at Plato's Cave Podcast at gmail.com or on Twitter at Jordan underscore C underscore Myers. And all of those will be listed in the description below. And as always, thank you for listening and keep struggling to escape the cave. <laughs>